It's the age-old question, should you lift your four-wheel drive more than two inches? We've got this GU in the workshop today and we're going to show you exactly what happens when you lift a vehicle and how that changes the suspension geometry resulting in affecting how the vehicle drives and handles on and off-road. Keep watching to find out if bigger lifts are actually better. We're going to go in depth like you've never seen before with the suspension experts to show you what changes when you lift your four-wheel drive, how much extra it'll cost you to go a bigger lift and what affects flex and so much more. This is what a live axle front suspension setup looks like. This is what an IFS front suspension setup looks like. With an IFS or independent front suspension four wheel drive, you really only want to go 40 or 50 mils, which is typically your two inch lift. Look at the front upper and lower arms in this ute. They're very short and this causes them to operate at terrible angles when lifted too high. You want the arms sitting slightly uphill from the wheel to the chassis for handling and bump stop absorption reasons. When you lift it to two inches, you can see that components like shock absorbers don't hit suspension arms and the wheel alignment stays fairly standard and can be easily corrected. When you lift your IFS to say four inches, then you really start to upset the suspension geometry. Because the upper and lower arms are so short, they move through some serious angles, plus your CV joints are sitting at huge angles too. To correct this involves relocating the front diff moving suspension pickup points, and to be honest, more work than it's worth. If you want more ground clearance and much better wheel travel and articulation, then look at a live front axle four-wheel drive. Here's why. Live axle four-wheel drives flex better than IFS production four-wheel drives because of the length of the front arms. The short arms offer very limited wheel travel compared to a live axle, which can allow much more up and down travel in the suspension. So why do manufacturers put IFS in modern vehicles? Simple. They handle on the road better because when one tyre hits a bump, it doesn't affect the other wheel. If you want to go higher, there's the ability to, but it's going to cost you a lot of extra money to realign everything without giving you an insane amount of extra off-road ability. We're going to see what happens when you focus on fitting a suspension lift to a live axle four-wheel drive and show you the difference between a two-inch right up to a four-inch lift. The reason you would fit a lift bigger than two inch is to get more ground clearance under the chassis to climb over rocks and ruts. But most importantly, it's to give you more clearance between the tire and the body to fit taller tires for a bigger footprint and better grip off-road. Taller lifts give you better approach angles, ramp over angles and departure angles to allow you to climb bigger obstacles and reduce damage. With lifts over two inches, you really need to look at legalities and engineering laws before you fit them too. When you lift a four-wheel drive more than two inches, you gain some off-road advantages but lose on-road ability too. Going higher than two inches can also cost you a lot more money. You can get a legal three inch plus suspension lift by getting your vehicle mod plated, which requires engineering, road testing and certification. But this will cost you more time and money and effort compared to just installing a two inch suspension lift that will handle better and take you everywhere off road. Also, engineering laws vary from state to state. Look at all the extra components you need for a four inch lift compared to a two inch lift. When you lift the front of a solid axle vehicle, you increase the angle of the front radius arm. With a two inch lift, you can see that the angle of these front radius arms are pointed further down towards the ground. When you lift a four wheel drive, you increase the angle of the front radius arm like this. Let's have a closer look at how these increased radius arm angles affect driving. Imagine this broom is a radius arm. When it's nice and flat and it's moving along, as you can see, it moves on quite freely. But the problem is if you lift a four wheel drive, you're changing the angle of that arm. Now, if I try and push the same thing, see how it's much harder to push the broom along? It's kind of a bit of a basic theory, but the idea behind it remains the same. You want that arm to be as flat as possible so that when your front diff hits bumps, it moves through its range of motion rather than wanting to fight the vehicle. That's why a lot of cars, when you lift them, start to drive like dogs if you lift them too high and don't do anything about that angle of your radius arm. Lifting your live axle suspension reduces your caster angle, which gives less control through the steering, less front tire grip in turns, and less steering feel through the steering wheel. 
There's essentially two main ways to fix caster. The first is using an offset caster correction bush. As you can see, the crush tube isn't centered and that allows the caster to be brought back to standard. The second is using a super pro lift correction arm. The caster in this arm is corrected through the arm. As you can see, the bush and the crush tube is centered. Looking from the front of the four wheel drive as you lift it, watch as we show you how much the diff moves sideways across the chassis. So as you just saw, as we increase the height of the vehicle, the entire diff moves to one side and that's because the panhard rod moves in an arc and as the height increases, it's physically pulling everything over to one side. With a two inch lift, that movement's quite small, but if you want to fix it, the best way is with an adjustable panhard rod. The same thing happens in the rear as well, so you need to put an adjustable panhard rod in the back too, if you want to bring everything back into the center where it wants to sit. You can also see from the side here that as we lift the four wheel drive, the poor old prop shaft gets us some big angles and this can cause vibrations and wear. Another important thing to check when you're lifting a solid axle vehicle is to ensure that the tail shaft doesn't bind on anything at full droop. In patrols, for example, this cross member, when you lift the vehicle, the tail shaft can bind on it. With a two inch lift, a way to get around it is by flipping the shaft so the slip joints at this end. But with a four inch lift, you actually need to get a professional to notch the cross member so there's enough clearance. One of the most important things to consider when you are lifting a vehicle is your sway bar links. But Shane, you were telling me before that a lot of people lift their vehicle and then wonder why their sway bar links bind up. Yeah, what, what we find is a lot of people lift their vehicle, don't do anything about their sway bars or links, and go off road and wonder why they either A, break a link or B, lose flex. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is you need to get a super pro adjustable link or just an extended link. Mm -hmm and get it so the sway bar comes back Brings into a neutral back. Yep, position. Yeah. Because if you don't, your sway bar is up mm -hmm. and it starts to engage at a much higher height. Yep. Because you've got extended droop, it puts an extra poundage on the opposite sway. And like, that's why people snap links and things? Yep. Yeah, yeah cool. it'll generally either snap it or tear it clean out of the vehicle. Definitely, so extending your links, you still get that on-road drivability and it still works well off-road. Yeah, definitely. When lifting most four wheel drives over two inches, you also need extended brake lines because you don't want your standard brake lines stretching and tearing off like this when the higher suspension lift flexes and breaks them. Another thing you need to consider when you're lifting a four wheel drive pretty much to any height is you need to adjust the rear brake proportioning valve. This is less important on vehicles with ABS. Although keep in mind that vehicles with ABS may not have a brake proportioning valve. The brake proportioning valve adjusts how much work the rear brakes do compared to the front and when you lift a four wheel drive, you alter how this operates. An important thing to remember, if you're lifting a vehicle higher than two inches, every inch you go up is gonna cost you close to around $1,000, which is a considerable extra cost to fork out just to lift your four wheel drive a little bit higher. You can go a bigger lift in live axle vehicles, but it's good to know what you're in for when you're doing it. If you own a live axle four wheel drive like the GU and you plan on doing some tougher tracks, here's a few things you need to consider to get your four wheel drive flexing more. Obviously, the more flex you have, the more often you'll keep all four wheels on the ground, giving you more traction. And flex isn't just about putting longer shocks in either. A few examples of things that can limit flex are your shock length, your sway bars, your link arms, and even your brake lines. The big limitation in the front end is these four bushes here are fighting each other when the front axle flexes. That's why you need better bushes in the front radius arms like these Super Pro ones. The rear suspension typically has four trailing arms and a panhard rod. This helps reduce the bushes binding up and fighting each other so it flexes better than the front. Getting the right coils in your four-wheel drive is essential for on-road ride, ability to carry weight and off-road performance. It's actually pretty interesting how a coil spring works. If you were to take this coil and stretch it out, you essentially get a long bit of steel like this. And what actually happens is, as your vehicle suspension moves up and down, this bit of steel will twist. So you can see that a thicker steel rod would make a stiffer spring, and a shorter steel rod would also make a stiffer spring as they're harder to twist. There are essentially two main types of spring, a progressive spring and a linear spring. This is a linear spring. What that essentially means is the thickness stays the same and the spacing stays the same through the whole spring. That means that they're good at carrying one weight. You usually find these in the front of vehicles where you have a bull bar and a winch and the engine, where the weight doesn't really change that much no matter what you put in the vehicle. 
This is a progressive rated spring. It's a little bit more technical. A progressive rated spring essentially means that the thickness steps up through the coil. And if you have a look, you can also see that the spacing is closer together here and further apart here. That essentially means that as you load this spring up, it's gonna use a section of the spring that's better for load carrying. But at the end of the day, if you're not really sure on what springs to run for your vehicle, make sure you speak to the experts like the team at Fulcrum. In the old days, coil springs could sag after they were repeatedly overloaded. Nowadays, modern coils are made from much better steel with different additives mixed in, which almost eliminates sagging in properly designed coils. The trick to getting your car riding comfortable once you've lifted it and getting it sitting right is all about spring rate. Here at Fulcrum, when you ring up and we talk to you, we'll ask you certain questions, like what bull bar you have, what winch you have, do you have a dual battery set up? Do you carry weight in the rear? Okay, this vehicle here we got behind us, this patrol, it has a bull bar, it has a winch, and it has a dual battery in the front, okay? So what we've gone in the front of this is we've gone a linear rate, heavy duty spring, okay? The weight's not gonna change much over the front. This will give a true 50 mil lift and ride fairly comfortable. In the rear, the guy's got a set of drawers, so he's gonna be constantly changing his load, although it is heavy. So what we've gone is a slightly heavier duty progressive rate spring. That should hold it up at that 50 mil and be nice and comfortable on the road. Live axle four wheel drives have much more suspension travel than an IFS vehicle. They're also heavier and can carry bigger loads. It's for these reasons that the shock has to deal with much more weight as it moves up and down through its range of travel. And as a result of carrying the heavy loads, it also creates more heat than you'd see in an IFS vehicle. To help the shock absorbers dampen the spring energy, they need to be bigger in diameter to allow for a larger piston and to hold more oil to keep the temperatures down. Look at how much bigger these Formula Big Bore shocks are than standard. They hold a massive amount more oil than standard too. If you own a live axle four wheel drive, make sure you're putting in quality Big Bore shocks like these. We've given the Big GU two inches of lift so it can easily fit 33 inch tires. It flexes a lot better, and we've gone with these weighted springs in the front and back, so there's less roll around corners, but it still flexes well. All these vehicles run two inch lifts and bigger tires to suit their four wheel drive. They go all over Australia on the harshest tracks with no issues. Just remember, if you do want to go more than a two inch lift, you can, but remember that there are a multitude of things to consider from engineering right through to how the vehicle drives on the road. I put a four inch lift in my Hilux when we did the solid axle conversion, but whilst it drives really well off-road, it's definitely not as good as it used to be on road. Don't just take my word for it though, here's my mate Sean with his thoughts on the lifts he's put in his vehicles. When it comes to suspension, my firm belief is try and fit the biggest size tyres with the smallest amount of lift. Now that's really good for a lot of reasons. Firstly, it'll make your vehicle handle better on road. I think it handles better off road as well because your center of gravity is a lot lower. In fact, I put it into place with Sooty. I had originally a four inch lift on that vehicle and 35s. I lowered it to a three inch vehicle and I found the vehicle performed just as good as it ever, if not better off road, but also better on road. And um, lowering that vehicle really did not hold it back on those tracks. And you've probably seen for yourself, that vehicle goes absolutely anywhere. So that my hot tip really is, is to use the smallest amount of suspension lift for the biggest size tires that you want to run. Well, there you go. That's a great video from Jocko. And I'll tell you what, if there's one bloke who knows his suspension inside and out, and especially how to get the most out of your suspension for off-road use, is definitely Jocko. Some fantastic points raised. And I reckon there's enough information in there for you to get the information you need to pick the right suspension for your particular full drive application. Heaps of great tips. And I'll tell you what, suspension is one of those things on a vehicle, you've got to get it right. It'll change the whole way your four wheel drive drives, both on and off road, and of course, the safety of your vehicle. Like always, we love hearing from you guys. So make sure you comment below and let us know what size lift you're running on your four wheel drive, and more importantly, if you're happy with it. To make an even better value for money when you choose a formula lift kit and get it installed by Fulcrum, well, they're gonna give you a free recovery kit worth 140 bucks. To find out all the details, go to fulcrumsuspensions.com.au.